and welcome back. I hope you had a good break. It was a little bit longer than planned because we had the ultimate tech issue explosion. So my team here had the composure under pressure mantra. They were very, very good at doing many things at once to get us back to you and bring you our next speaker. Um, I'm sure you've already had amazing insights and creativity around Christopher's presentation to lead you into environments and values and the holistic uh, ecological athlete. So it's going to be an exciting time as we move forward. Um, Terry and I and our team, Steve, Phil and Kirik, there were five of us, sat in a three-day retreat uh, two years before the Sydney Olympics to go through everything Christopher talked about. The values, the guiding questions, our winning ways, our code of conduct, the standard of a champion, and we had our plan called the Gold Medal Excellence Plan. And it was about not just what we did on court, not about how we treated, just how we treated each other or the staff or the team, but how we approached everything in our life. It had everything about our values. Um, so I was so interested to hear Christopher's explanation and applied research on that. And the interesting thing for me is our values change over our time as an athlete. From that eight-year-old I talked about that had a dream all the way through to the maturing gold medalist, um, the values changed. And now, as a retired athlete, family is a high value for me. But what I've noticed even now, one of my high, highest top three values is winning. Uh, and that comes in many, many fashions. One of the things I learned across my career is that we have very strict rules for winning. So I ask you, what does winning mean to you? I often ask uh, my young athletes that I walk past to the Queensland Academy of Sport and the performance staff, I walk past them in the hallways and say, are you winning? And often they look at me like, well, don't you have to swim a race or run a race or win a volleyball match for that to happen? And I would challenge that the answer is no, you can win at all times. If your rules for winning aren't as strict as waiting four years for an Olympics or Paralympics, imagine if I had to wait four years before I declared myself a winner and only then having to win the race. So how do we win across this pathway? How do we, um, like Christopher said, in board games, create opportunities for winning? We've seen the competitive environment stifled over the last 12 months with COVID. And so I've tried to create winning environments for our athletes. I've, I've pitted beach volleyballers against softballers in archery so that those cortisol levels and adrenal glands can get the rush of competition. Because I think most athletes, um, especially in our developing and emerging pathways, love to win. Whilst it's not the highest priority, I would guarantee that a lot of them love to be in winning situations and play in environments like that. So we are going to move on to the next super powered presentation. We have a French Canadian hailing out of Montreal, Dr. Veronique Richard, French Canadian, otherwise known as Vero, as her nickname. She's earned a doctoral degree in sports science from the University of Montreal. She then went on to postdoctorate fellowships. She um, loves studying the effects of creativity enhancement on motor performance and psychological adaptation. Now, Vero, I have told everybody that your bio is available to be read online because I love to get to some of the juicy bits, right? So I'm not going to read through it all because most of her stuff is working on mental performance with Canadian national teams like water polo and artistic swimming, individual athletes, uh, gymnastics, figure skating, trampoline. Uh, but this is the cool part, Cirque du Soleil's mental performance advisor. Now, I don't know about you, but every time Cirque du Soleil comes to Australia, I try to go, and the last one was Totem. So I have seen uh, Vero nearly every single Cirque du Soleil. I've been to Vegas, I've done the whole strip, uh, and I love watching the athletes uh, perform. She works for the National Circus School on creativity 
projects. She stimulates the creativity, combines movement improvisation, creative problem solving, and collective ideation, and helps athletes and coaches all over the world, including Cricket Australia, Swimming Australia, AFL, to name a few. But as I said at the start of today, we've gone one step further to talk about our presenters' superpowers. So Vero's is that she wants to be able to live in other people's bodies for 24 hours only so that she can come back remembering what they were thinking, feeling and behaving like so that she now can adapt the environment so that everybody um, has an optimal environment. And we just heard from Christopher how important the environment is. So no limit to how many body she can live in but when she understands everybody's differences she comes back to make it a better world so over to you Vera we look forward to hearing your amazing superhero presentation thank you so much now for that wow um it makes me laugh uh so well first I'm totally honored to be here uh, unfortunately I cannot see anyone on the call but if some of my Australian colleague and friends are present. A big uh, hello to all of you. Um, I know I was, I'm really honored to be here because uh, I really, really strongly admire uh, Australian research. I 
optimization intervention coming from Cirque du Soleil on elite figure skater, yes, performance, self-esteem, creativity, and mindfulness skill. Just a little, as a little bit more background on me, I am myself a former figure skater, so it was easy to convince the figure skating community that that was worth it. You know, we always start with uh, people that we know. So nine figure skaters and their coaches, like their coaches were allowing them to join uh, the session. And I asked two Cirque du Soleil teachers if they would be willing enough to join me in this adventure of testing their approach, but measuring mental skills or the mental skills that you see on your screen. I, I was really unsure that they would tell me yes, but they were thrilled with the idea of testing their approach, but not just for the artistic skill, but for mental skill. So both of them accepted, and all together we designed a 20 hours intervention for those nine skaters. Uh, first 10 hours, it was comic improvisation. But when I say comic, it was clowning. Like those athletes had never done anything similar. Like if you want to get out of your shell, this is like the perfect intervention. So Massimo, name of the teacher, ran the first 10 hours and then Michu um, ran the 10, like 10 last hours. And she has more of a theatrical improv um, approach. So 20 hours and measuring different mental skills. Hopefully now I got you curious about the outcome of this research. Uh, so as you can see on your screen right now, we got an improvement on all the different variables that we were measuring. But two of them were uh, significant. And of course, the one that I, I was the most curious about is that um, creative attitude and values uh, were act actually significant. And I was like, oh, wow. So maybe this could become an intervention to develop creativity in athletes. But what was the most interesting to me was what the skaters and their coaches told me after the intervention. So here's a few quotes uh, from the interview that we conducted following uh, the intervention. So first, one skater shared with me, uh, you know, by doing those interventions, it helps me to put aside the robot you don't want to be and free the automatism you want while performing. One of the coaches, okay, this coach was really funny because at the beginning when I explained to him the intervention, he was not initially really into this, but after a few weeks and at the end of the intervention, he shared with me that uh, one of his athletes, she lets herself loose, she lets herself go, she's not as closed off, she's more open, she moves more. So he was really, really impressed by how much she transformed by doing this. Uh, then, another athlete shared with me, I think during the classes, it was a major thing to not care about what we looked like, which the teachers were repeating that a lot. Just do it, just do it, and then improve on that. Improvisation exercises help you to become more aware of how to keep your focus in the present moment, which was heavily linked to the mindfulness skills that I was testing. And finally, uh, I am now less afraid to try new things because it is how you can improve and get better. Creative attitude and values, I, 
outcome, the criteria of novelty and usefulness is really appropriate. Creativity is much more than an outcome. So more recent definition would agree that creativity actually emerged from an interaction uh, with the individual and the environment. And that was saying that uh, Christopher, I think, was talking about the environment earlier. And of course, to help people become more creative, environment is really key. And we will talk a, a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. The individual must also possess some skills and be in certain state to become more creative. And when the individual is having the skills like willingness to take risk and open um, openness, which the skaters told me, and, and the environment is optimal, then creativity can emerge. And yes, what I'm mostly interested about is the emergence of creative movement. Uh, so first question I will try to answer today. Which methods can lead to the emergence of creative movement? Because if we say environment matters in terms of creativity, uh, we need to know how to instill a better environment so we can trigger creative movement, which can help us perform better. But the other question that I'm even more interested about is can Moving creatively or creative movement facilitate the emergence of other skills. So, you know, in sport, we tend to move in a really prescribed way. Would there be some benefits to move a little bit more freely in different types of movement, not just specializing in your sport, but, you know, going and diversifying your experiences a little bit more? Uh, so this is also something I will try to answer today, but I am telling you right from the start, I don't have a complete answer yet, but this is definitely something that is driving uh, my research and my curiosity a lot. So let's start by which method, how can we uh, promote the emergence of creative movement? I'm pretty sure some of you know uh, a lot of things coming from ecological dynamics. And I will summarize this here uh, really, really briefly. But one thing you want to do in order to promote the emergence of creative movement is, is to create a little bit of chaos. You want to create chaos not only in the body, but in the entire environment. So, yes, your athlete will fall into this instability state where you don't really know how to navigate the situation. You haven't found the perfect movement to be really efficient but you're exploring different options. Uh, some athletes will react a lot to this, like they will be really, really uncomfortable, and some will actually thrive because some like to explore movement. So now that, I, now that I'm applying those methods in really like applied setting, I discovered that there's a huge range of reaction, but most of the time when you create the chaos, either in the body or in the environment, there will be this period of instability. Good news is that our human system is highly adaptable. So we will always try to find a way to reorganize and find, find strategy in order to regain a certain type of stability, which we hope will be highly functional and might also be novel. So next question or the next question that comes in mind is, okay, so how can I create chaos? Uh, Nonlinear pedagogy is something that um, I, I really got interested in when I was searching for an explanation why my initial study, why improvisation helped people improve psychologically that much. And when I was searching, um, rapidly I fell into uh, Chow research about nonlinear pedagogy. And when I compared to improv, it was like, hmm, that those two have a lot of things in common and one of these things is it is um, constraint led so yes improv will always put little constraint well just improvising with someone is an initial constraint that you need to deal with uh, it will have a lot of direct variability sorry my French accent sometimes is coming up and finally it will encourage people to even do mistakes because in improv at least mistakes can be 
call risk-friendly environment. Yes, I know we talk a lot about, about psychological safety, which I'm totally in agreement with. Yet, I feel that sometimes with psychological safety, people kind of tend to overprotect and be more into the, um, uh, like, yeah, overprotect, I think would be a, a good way to describe this. I want to encourage people to take risk, but risk that will bring you somewhere else. And to do that, you need to have the appropriate support. If, yes, the environment is messy, full of constraint, variability, problem solving, novelty, uncontrollability, ambiguity, predictability, spontaneity. This is a lot of word complicated for me. Uh, <laughs> it has to be balanced with a supportive environment. And by supportive environment, I am saying like encouraging difference in originality, supporting mistake, uh, being autonomy, like autonomy supportive, and accepting the state of evolution of everyone. So by creating a risk-friendly environment, not only you can support the emergence of creative movement, but we will see uh, whether we can, we can also support the emergence of other skills. So after my PhD, where now I was kind of really, really getting into the universe of creativity, I got invited at Florida State University to work with Dr. Tenenbaum uh, in the sports psych lab. And when I arrived there, people knew that I was coming with this topic, creativity, uh, that was also triggering some curiosity around that. And there was this uh, program, it's a program for, for kids that uh, is pretty much implemented in most elementary school in uh, the state of Florida and it's called Champions Program and maybe some of you are American or know the American way but it was a highly like militarized program like they were lining up the kids and all, all the kids were like doing squat all together and they were doing push-up all together and they were doing like high knees all together and that was like super like yes um, of course they became aware that this was maybe a little bit old school and that maybe kids could benefit from a different style of exercise. And oh, by the way, Champion is an extra uh, fitness program. So it's like they have their regular um, physical education program. And then there there is this extra fitness program that are actually uh, led by most of the time it's university uh, students that are taking over uh, this program. So from this super militarized program, they come to me and they were like, hey, could we test an approach that not only improve um, kids' fitness, but that could also maybe promote creativity in them? And I thought the idea was genius. So I was like, yeah, sure, let's, let's take, like, let's take this challenge and let's create a new program called Creative Champion. It was not really creative on that one, but whatever. So we call this Creative Champion, and basically what we did, uh, first we trained 12 different fitness educators. So we trained them for a 12-hour uh, session, and then we targeted especially the fourth graders, and I'm gonna explain to you later on why we targeted fourth graders. I think we have a similar system, so fourth graders are approximately nine or 10 years old, um, which I believe is pretty much the same in Australia. So we targeted those and we had four groups that we were uh, implementing the creative champion and four groups that we were testing, but that we were just not doing any special intervention other than continuing their regular champion program. So what does, what does this activity or program look like? So on the left, the conventional program so it was always the same starting with a warm-up and after there was a circuit uh, more like mobility and movement and then there was a circuit more muscular as you can see we took the exact 
10 years old, like they can do a lot of like body weight stuff. Uh, same with the 10 yard speed. Okay, do the 10 yard speed, but we want you to do funny thing with your arm. Oh my God, like, you know, it was the that type of uh, uh, period of time. We saw a lot of, they, they like doing uh, different movements with their arms while running. Same with the flutter kick. Hey, why flutter kick needs to be like that? You can go this way, you can bend your knees, you can do thing with your feet, and the, the kids were quite creative. So as you see, from nonlinear pedagogy, we implemented different method in the champion. Of course, to make sure that our two programs were actually different, we went and observed the fitness instructor for at least four sessions each, actually exactly four sessions each, not at least. Um, and then you can see that compared to the conventional program, the instructions of the creative program were much more varied. Manipulation of constraint, variability, freedom, problem solving, imagination, uh, a lot of different type of instruction compared to the regular program, which were mainly about regular uh, instruction about technique or demonstrating the movement to do. Same with feedback. We had a lot of feedback in the creative program that was encouraging innovation, difference, originality, and a lot of encouragement of the proper execution in the regular pro program. So, we again you're curious to see the result. Interestingly, and this was totally randomized, so we picked four classes for creative, four classes for conventional, and when we look at the, the results first, we were like, oh my God, our groups are so different at the start. Um, by the way, I talked to you uh, earlier about, maybe I didn't talk to you earlier about divergent thinking and movement creativity. So uh, there is this, when I talked about traditional creativity, it's often measured with divergent thinking task. What is divergent thinking? It's this capacity to generate alternative, uh, alternative ideas to a problem or to a situation. So it's usually measured with three different criteria. Fluency, the capacity to generate many, many, many ideas. Then flexibility, the flexibility, the capacity to generate many ideas in different category, different type of idea. And third, originality, which is the rareness of your ideas compared to a group, uh, a particular group. It's the same with movement. So when we do movement creativity assessment, we will measure how many movement kids can do, uh, how in which different categories those movements belong, and finally, how original. And in the case of champion, we were using different tasks. So for instance, one task is to go from one line to the other line, which is approximately two and a half meters away. And you have to go from one line to the other line in as many different ways as possible. Uh, throw a ball, a bean bag in our case, we just didn't want to run after the ball all the time, but in as many different ways as possible. So tasks like that. And what we found, actually we got to a significant result for movement creativity and the kids after the creative program were actually uh, more fluid to like uh, generating more movement and they were also more flexible meaning that they were generating more movement that were belonging to different movement categories other interesting results because we were also testing divergent thinking because we wanted to see if it has more than a uh, movement component, we got pretty interesting result or significant result for uh, divergent thinking, the originality criteria. So as you see here, the kids in the creative program uh, got better than the other. I'm sure that by now, just a slide back, you are wondering, but why the kids in the regular program crashed so much? Because our significance, yes, the kids in the creative program increased. But our significance also comes from the fact that the kids in their regular program really got worse in their creativity. This program was held, uh, was conducted, sorry, over a three months period. And um, I don't see, I don't know if you see well uh, my screen, but this is something that we discussed in our paper. But what we think actually there's 
called the Fort Grant Slump. So apparently, around the age of 10, the creativity in kids start to decrease. And this is because they go from pre-conventional stage, which is you don't really understand the social norms, to the conventional stage where it's like, okay, now you understand the social norms. And because you understand the social norms, your creativity will tend to drop. So it's still a hypothesis that we discuss in our paper, but we think that this risk-friendly environment that we created um, with the Creative Champion Program might have helped to stop this uh, kind of understanding or caring too much about social norm and just kept the kids in this like freedom of thinking and moving that is actually uh, really important for creativity to emerge. We also measure, because I'm, as I said since the beginning, super interested in that, we also measure uh, different variables such as self-efficacy, perception of task difficulty, and probability of adaptation, which I will explain more in detail later. Unfortunately, those results um, were non-significant, which really got me like, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like when I was seeing the kids, I was seeing that they were gaining confidence in how self-efficacy and how they were moving. They were socially also more communicating. I felt that they were maybe perceiving tasks as more accessible. So I, I was, to be honest, like really disappointed that we could not find anything, but really motivated to keep going and see whether we could find something in another study. Um, I was lucky enough, I was invited to go to Israel for a two months, um, I don't want to call this an internship, a two months period of time at Wingate Institute uh, in a genetic lab. So that was super interesting and what we did during my two months period is that we tested the, we tested the difference between movement improv, I'll explain shortly, uh, aerobic dancing, and uh, nothing. On um, both, again, motor creativity and divergent thinking. What is movement improvisation? It's actually a program that I've developed from many different experiences, for sure, what I see at Cirque du Soleil and at the National Cirque School, but also from my skating experience and other experience that I had in my um, in my life, I guess, and um, also from the literature and what I what I read about nonlinear pedagogy, improvisation, literature. So uh, I won't talk too much about movement improv because a uh, little cell pitch here. Uh, we will talk a lot about movement improv at the world class to world best conference in February. So if you want to know more, attend that conference. Okay, moving on to the next. We got really similar results. So, uh, 100 students, 92, sorry, 92 students that we divided in three groups. First group doing movement improv, totally free type of moving on music, different situation. Second group, aerobic dancing, still music, but now it's like you follow the leader, have no freedom. Third group. They do. They, they read some stuff and they answer little question just to make sure they they uh, they read the stuff. Randomly selected, randomly um, distributed into the different groups. We run that for five hours. So it was uh, during five weeks, two times thirty minutes per week. We got really similar results as what we got with the creative champion. So the. Um, uh, participant in the movement improv, which was this much more non-linear type of movement, uh, they improve the most in um, fluidity, motor fluidity and flexibility. Uh, they improve much more than aerobic dancing and the control condition. They also improve much more into original thinking than the two other groups, which are exactly the same result as what we got for champion. We also asked them to really briefly at the end of the intervention tell us what was this like what was this intervention about for you? And we got really interesting answers, really similar to the first circus study that I showed you. Uh, I gained ideas on every subject, I got to think deeper, to experiment to experiment more quickly. Um, I learned to attribute 
attribute less importance to the fears of the result and to act more accordingly to the initial impulses and from there the result were better. But I want to bring your attention to the middle quote because there is a little story around that quote. There was this girl, I will call her Dana. This is a fake name, not her real name. So Dana was unlucky enough to be part of the movement improv group. And when she understood what was this about, like a lot of freedom, you move in the way you want, uh, improvisation, which is really like unpredictable. Oh my God, she was not happy. You know, when you try to do something different and you have this resistor in your group, she was totally resistant. Um, I, I could feel by her non-engagement in all activities, uh, she was always looking at me like rolling her eyes. The first session was terrible, literally terrible. She was doing nothing. Uh, second session was as terrible. She came in like totally unmotivated and all the rest of the group were following the activities pretty well, but she was not into it. Um, at the end of the second session, I was asking them, so I was dividing the participant in the group in small groups of three or four students. And uh, they had to pick a fairy tale. Any fairy tale you might think about, pick one and just divide the role in between your team and pick a scene, any scene of this fairy tale. So I give them one or two minutes to organize and then they have to play in front of me. So they have to act the fairy tale without speaking because in movement improv there is no speaking, only through movement. And during the improv, I play with them. So I let them do the beginning of their improv and then suddenly I can ask them, okay, now I want you to do it fast forward. So now they have to move really, really, really quickly. And then I stop them and I'm like, okay, now slow motion. And then like if you are a robot, you get the, the point. This dear Dana, to show me how not happy she was being in that group, she decided she was not just Sleeping Beauty, which would have been pretty smart. You know, you sleep the whole time, so you don't necessarily move. No, she decided to be the bed under Sleeping Beauty, meaning that she was a furniture. So she was not moving the entire improv. Uh, in movement improv, there's two rules. And the second rule is that there is no rule. Actually, you can answer any situation that I suggest the way you want. Therefore, she was following the rule. So instead of like, uh, of course she wanted to provoke me and she wanted to see whether that second rule was true. So after the improv, she was looking at me and you know, and the students were all laughing. So I started laughing with them and I was like, oh my God, that was the most original improv I've seen in my life. And then she looked at me and she was like, what? I'm actually provoking you here by doing nothing. And I, she didn't say it, but she was so surprised. And I was like, you know, Dana, you followed where you are at. You actually did something that was okay for you. Oh, and I didn't say that the whole time she had her face to the floor. So she was not even looking at anyone. And I'm like, it's all good. Like you responded to the situation the way that was appropriate for you. And she didn't say anything because I think she was just literally surprised. So she left. That stayed this way. Third session. She came back. And suddenly, first activity, hmm, I was like, my God, she's kind of a little bit involved. Like, she's kind of trying. She was not the best mover, let's be honest. But she was letting herself go a little bit more. And then fourth session, even more. Five, and then I was like, oh my God, she, she's letting go of the ego and the like, I don't want to be here. And she's just engaging now. Uh, 10 session later, so session.
judgmental to myself. I could just not reach my full potential. And uh, on the other, like on the more formal stuff, she wrote, I learned not to judge myself, to be more open and less shy. Think about things differently. For me, that was the moment where I was like, oh my God, yes, there is an impact of those activities on something more than only movement. Although our results are really targeting movement and a little bit cognitive skills, I was still convinced. I told you that I joined Dr. Tenenbaum, right, uh, for my postdoc. And if some of you in the room know Dr. Tenenbaum, you know how much he, la he loves lab study. And I'm not really lab study, so we had a, some moment of like arguing about doing more applied studies or doing more lab. So I did a lab study to test my approach about, I'm sure movement creativity has something to do with more than ju just uh, movement. So, okay, that might look a bit complicated, but I, go, I will go through that pretty quickly and it's not that complicated because I wanted to test whether both movement creativity and divergent thinking, which is the most more cognitive side of creativity, could have an impact on adaptation. And I was seeing adaptation or uh, defining adaptation in three different aspects. Psychological adaptation, which is, uh, according to one of Tenenbaum's paper that you might have read, uh, a combination of self-efficacy and perception of task difficulty. So if you face a situation and you feel you have a lot of skills to perform the task at hand, and you also perceive that the task is either easy or accessible, your probability of adaptation is higher. We also wanted to know whether there will be behavioral adaptation. Would participant persist, and you will understand why later, would participant vary their answer or they would just keep doing the same? And finally, we wanted to know if there would be effective adaptation, which is uh, arousal, so how much activated they will get, and whether they will find the challenge as play pleasant or not pleasant. So what did we do? Uh, in the lab, we set that circuit. One by one, participants, which were undergraduate students, were coming to the lab, and we were explaining them through a video to uh, standardize everything. We were explaining them what they like basic instructions. So basically, they had to go uh, over hurdles, then they had to jump in four different um, rings, then they had to pick the medicine ball and walk backward, backwards. I hate that word. On the beam, then they had to touch cones as fast as possible, of course. Then they had to take a plank position and go up and down diff uh, three medicine ball. Finally, they were grabbing a ball and they had to throw in a bucket three different balls. But the thing is that they were coming to the lab and we were telling them that we were having a chart, which was a lie, and that we knew for a um, undergrad student what was the best possible time. And we were having a chart telling us like, hey, if you are in the best percentile of a student, a college student population, you should do around those times. And it's not true. We just created a scenario which they all believe in. So what we were asking them after explaining them, the cir circuit was, where do you think you, you stand in terms of athletic ability uh, compared to the college population? So let's say I think I'm a really, really good athlete. I will say, I think I'm in the top 10. Okay, great. So we know which time you should do if you think you are in the top 10. So the goal was to go through this circuit as fast as possible. And at the end of the circuit, we will tell you whether you reach your goal of being in the top 10 or whether you don't. We were not telling them the time that they were doing, just the result, if they reach their goal or not. Of course, I hope you're seeing me coming. Whatever the time they were doing, we were always telling them that they were failing to reach their goal. They had up to 10 times to reach their goal, but they could stop at any time. At any point, they could stop. So what do you think happened? People went through the circuit once. Of course, we were like, hey, you did good, but unfortunately, you haven't reached your goal of being in the top 10 of the college population. Do you want to try again? Some, all of them tried at least three. Uh, at least twice. So they went, did it, did it a second time, same thing. If they were doing a lot better, we were saying, hey, you did a lot better on that and you're 
getting really close, but unfortunately you haven't reached your goal, you want to try again. Some did the 10 trials and like some did, did the 10 trials like if their life was dependent on that. <laughs> and some did, our average was six. So like average of six trials. What did we discover doing this? Uh, first, oh yeah, we were also testing, sorry, I need to explain that. We were testing their movement creativity and we were testing their divergent thinking. So what did we discover? First, being a creative mover. So those that were moving more fluently with more flexibility, not flexibility like this, but more different types of movement and originality, actually it, it increases their probability of adaptation. Why is that? Well, those that were more flexible mover were perceiving the circuit as more flexible than those that were not. And when confronted with the goal failure, because this was goal failure, they were failing, failing over and over again, original movers were more persistent, but God, they were not more flexible. And I was shocked by that. Even if we were telling them that they were failing, participants were always trying the same method to go through the circuit. And we were making it so crystal clear that you have to follow the basic rule, but you can perform this circuit in any way you want. Like, for instance, you can change your starting point. That was not a something we were imposing on them. But really few did. Really few changed their solution, yet the more um, original mover persisted a lot, which makes sense. And finally, after failing, because after 10, they could not do it again, original mover reported more positive emotional state. So, all those research together, to me, it just gives me the, the desire or increases my desire to apply that to the field. I was like, okay, can we move more creatively? Even in sport that doesn't really dictate creative movement, so as uh, Nat told you, I work with water polo, I work with gymnastic, I work with different sport, and creativity is not necessarily the outcome we want, but can we use creative movement to develop something else? And this is where the applied part of this presentation come into play. I think we need to take a much better transdisciplinary approach, and by that I mean that Sports sciences should not just work together. Like, oh, I speak to the strength and conditioning guy once in a while. No, no, no. The skills should be developed in sessions that are combined. And with one of my amazing Canadian colleagues here, strength and conditioning uh, guy, we decided that we were going to test that approach. So to me, all sports sciences are uni united by one thing, and it's movement. We all want to make like the movement of human better. Of course, we want to make human better, and uh, I'm a mental performance. But movement is something that we should all work with. So that's why I'm like, hey, can we move creatively to shape the mind optimally? And can we combine this strength and conditioning with mental performance with diff different goals? So my strength and conditioning and mental performance project that we started this this summer with one of our team we work with was to achieve specific mental performance goal through movement. So what were those specific goals? First, 
so in the video. Our girls tend to uh, come with a little bit of like uh, attitude, so we definitely have the goal in mind uh, of like the physical goal and the mental goal in mind of activating them. It's a, it's really used as an activation because after they go to a, a strength session, communication and planning, the strength and conditioning guy and are actually spending way more time planning these activity than doing them. <laughs> it's a bit like ridiculous, but it's a lot of fun. Then we set the environment in the gym. We make sure that it's clear like that they can navigate this freely. We, we give at least total freedom. Once it's set and the rules are set, then navigate that the way you want. Observe what emerges. So many things you can observe. Like first, how do they respond? As I point out in the video, if you were reading the text, like if we give the same instruction and some respond in a much more traditional way using traditional movement and some use those session to just express themselves freely. So response are really different and it tells a lot about the players, the interaction between the players, who is getting with who for which reason, because again, this is total freedom. We never uh, plan this and the strategies that they use. Will they go more the creative route? Will they go more the cognitive route? Like how will they navigate the activity? And the debrief, I always take a big five minutes to debrief with them. What was the challenges during the activity? How they navigate these challenges? What was like uh, more complex for them? And a lot of information are coming out of it. And of course, then we go from there and we adapt for the next session. So. Uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a overall picture of movement creativity and how you can apply it. So to go back to my initial question, which method? So I think I hope I made it clear that uh, nonlinear pedagogy approach, uh, improv improvisation method, even if it's not totally sport related, but it's movement related, can definitely definitely lead in the study that I've conducted. And I mean, there's a lot of other uh, scientists that are conducting research answering that question. And now we start having more of a good evidence-based approach to develop creative uh, movement. Yet, as I said, I think we are still too much oriented towards the impact of those methods on creative movement and not enough on how creative movement can actually facilitate the emergence of other skills. I showed you a little bit with my study, um, the circuit study, that I think moving creatively can have some benefit when you face failure. Yet, I also, I hope show you with the strength and conditioning, uh, mental performance approach, I see like our team is getting much better since we do that. Uh, it's like cognitively, effectively, socially, yes, we need to find ways to measure that better and this is what will bring me to so what's next what's next in the world of movement creativity and its impact on uh different skills that are important for performance first i'm actually finishing a conceptual model um hopefully will be published soon because i need a solid scientific foundation for future studies and i hope some of you will join me in those studies, if you're interested in creativity, please reach out. We need, and I say we because I don't think I will find the answer alone, we need to develop holistic measurement methods. I believe that by moving creatively, we can develop different things, but we need to be able to measure that to show that this has a real impact. Yes, I use some method in uh, the studies that I showed you, but I think we can go much further in measuring uh, the uh, side effect of movement improvisation. We need to design longitudinal applied studies to progress and promote creativity with teams, clubs, organization. If we want creativity to uh, um, emerge more, it needs to be uh, done in a more like longitudinal, like not just a one shot intervention and now and then you're gone. And finally, which might happen, establishing a movement creativity lab in a university if I could work on that full time and stop doing the mental performance stuff that would be great and dear Aussie colleague that might happen in Australia who knows there might be a university that will design a create movement creativity 
Labs. So, on that note, I'm concluding with Csikszentmihalyi, uh, Halloween, which is a uh, really maybe one of the first uh, creativity researcher, which says in one of his popular books, unless enough people are motiv motivated by the enjoyment that comes from confronting challenges, by discovering new ways of being and doing, there is no evolution of culture, no progress in thoughts or feeling. Let's, I hope we can all join together and improve the sport culture by just increasing a little bit the creativity of it. On that note, with a good French word, merci beaucoup. Oh, Vera, merci beaucoup to you. That was amazing. <laughs> I, uh, wow, I have watched, like I said, creative movement a lot. And when I first started in my journey, I was very rigid. And my coach, Steve, had some amazing um, activities for us to do. Instead of with a volleyball, we used a tennis ball. We would, uh, across the net, we would throw the ball and use our wrist a lot more so that when we applied it back to the volleyball, uh, we could do things we never thought possible. Uh, he would also be very creative. Now, in hindsight, um, he would ask us to deliver an outcome with the ball and he would not tell us how. He would allow us to have that... Um, creativity of movement and he would also not judge he said I don't care what it looks like if you become the master of delivering the ball on the line eight meters away from um, your opposition then you'll win the match so I do I love your uh, philosophy of can we use creative movement to develop other areas and we are all united by movement but let's reshape some of the other areas of the performance pathway so that it can facilitate um, great results through creativity. So I love it. Let's crack on to some questions because they have just been flowing. Uh, Kristen said she loved your presentation um, and she wanted to know with the Creative Champions program, do you think that adults that have no theatrical background would need to do creative sessions on a regular basis basis to see similar improvements? or And what kind of frequency? Would it need to be in the warm-up every day, a session a week? Uh, what, what do you think? So that's an awesome question, actually. And that's why we need a creativity lab to answer more, like, really precisely those questions about frequency. We do movement. And actually, we have developed with uh, Coaching Better, which is an Australian co company. We have developed a creativity program for coaches, and we start with two hours of movement improv. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, adult, yes, adults have definitely forgotten how to move freely. That that's like it's at the beginning they are so uncomfortable. It's like oh wow. Uh, we do, but sometimes just this one shot, like two hours, and then we do some more creative um, intervention, like creative problem solving and creating their next practices as coaches, which this will be the topic of a world class to world best uh, conference talk. But yes, definitely with adult, it takes longer before they let go. Like before they let go of their walls, it takes longer. The frequency, what I see with um, the team, water polo team that you saw the video, we do it once a week. We believe that it could be more. We believe that, eh, once a week it has an impact, but if we were doing it twice a week, we might have we might hit a, a better outcome. But again, we need longitudinal study to really answer precisely uh, Kristen's question because now it's more what I observe, which to me as a scientist is not enough. I need to find a way to measure that. But promise that when I will have those answers, I will uh, publicly share uh, about that. Yeah, we have a lot of relationships with universities, Vero, so I think you keep uh, keep working on Australia to be world leading in the creative <laughs> movement. I think we'll have a shot. And I know my yoga teacher says it doesn't matter what you look like, you're downward dog, three-legged dog, the flip dog. So creative movement, very, very special. We have an interesting question here. Does this work for closed sports where repetition is the key to, develop, to developing specific techniques? Well, actually, I, I brought Mishu, that was part of my initial study. I brought her to gymnastic, uh, which I know there's an artistic side to gymnastic, and I'm not judging the sport, but it's really, really repetition, 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 and technique, technique, technique. And the athlete, which were pretty high-level athlete, were so like amazed by this at the beginning again super uncomfortable and gymnastics oh, it was so impressive the 
whatever. Like, it, it's, you will build through, and it, they could not, at the beginning, just move away from the questioning on how should the task be performed. So, yes, we, we tested it with uh, gymnastics. We haven't tested it scientifically with other sports, but so far, every sport that I've participated to either movement improv of, or other type of creative stuff that I've shown you, um, of course, it's never a 100%, let's be honest, some will not respond well to this, but most of the time we get a lot of positive uh, response in terms of, again, I'm mostly interested in moving differently to shape the mind optimally, so for me, the effective cognitive and social skills are what I observe the most. Great, so here's one for the coaches, um, as opposed to getting our coaches to foster creativity in our athletes, do you see there's a way to have our coaches embrace creativity in their own practices, i.e. how they coach? Uh, I, I, what's the name of this person that asked this question? Uh, anonymous. Oh, so anonymous, this is the start. If I had to pick one priority in my research would be to first make the coaches more creative. And that's exactly what we do with Coaching Better. Uh, we started a branch, Coaching Better with creativity, and we want to help coaches foster their own creativity. Not the creativity of their athlete, but how can you build your next practices? Come to world class to world best. This is exactly what we will talk about. Or reach out to me if you want to know more about our coach program because, yes, this is like the start of creative. If your coach is not necessarily creative and doesn't push uh, those types of method, then it's going to be hard for the athlete to, uh, to develop it. But amazing question, Anonymous. I love how you're selling in um, our next uh, presentation. <laughs> Maybe I pushed it a little bit too much, but it's... No, fun. it's fantastic. Well, I, had to divide, I had to divide my topic to make sure that those two would be so different that people will not be get sick of me. So, I, I yeah, we, we will talk. I think there is so much to explore here, the creative side, is, and it's never too late to learn, right? Because that was one of the questions. Is it is it too late for adults? Never too late. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, creativity can happen. Actually, we all have a creative potential. Like, it's just a matter of how much you use your potential. And even if you're 60 years old and you haven't used it yet, you still have this potential and you, we just need to find what will ignite this potential to be fulfilled. Fantastic. We have many, many questions, but we'll have to wait until the next conference. Right. Yeah, or reach out to me. My email is on the screen. Please don't hesitate. I would be more than happy to send you those papers that I presented today or just to answer some more specific questions. I hope you saw the passion I have for this topic, so uh, I'll be more than uh, pleased to do so. Merci to you. We thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to working collaboratively with you to bring creativity more to our athletes and our coaches. Thank you so Next, much. Anytime. Thank you, Nat. Okay, so in a wrap-up of today, we really appreciate your presence, your participation um, with those questions, and uh, it is really an, a, a wonderful opportunity. The knowledge, I have written so much um, to take away from this. I know I asked you for one thing, so at the end of today, I'd encourage you to sit down and highlight or pull out some of the things that you can put into your practice. If we go back to Christopher's presentation, living the values and aligning into the values that you set for you and your teams. Uh, the quote that I love, ask not what is inside your head, but what your head is inside of. Um, and I think we all will take on a little bit of orienteering as we navigate this performance pathway, um, because as Vero said, it is a bit messy sometimes. It is chaotic. It is not a linear straight line. It is creating an environment for our athletes, combining that with um, supportive and messy so that they can feel comfortable enough to take some risks. Getting that creative movement in there and I love the transdisciplinary approach of all of our teams so that we can use that creative movement to develop other areas that might not be specifically for the repetition of a specific skill, but the creativeness of other activities will lead to 
a better skill based. Uh, there is so much more that I took away. We've, we've gone through support and development today. Tomorrow we will head into identify and progress in the performance pathway. We have Des Ryan from the Arsenal Football Club and Joe Baker from York University. So again, I encourage you to sit with your notes for a little while and really absorb what you have learned today. Maybe also think about your superpower and what your superpower may be now and what superpowers you need to develop into the future. For me, my superpower is being in the right place at the right time with the right toolkit to get a winning result. So again, think about what yours is and I'd love to know, maybe tomorrow you can come back with that in the chat and identify what your superpower is. I look forward to finding out what Joe and Des's is tomorrow. So as we are about to wrap up, I thank you for your um, engagement and your participation. As I've said, I'd invite you to move a bit more creatively today see how that shows up for you and as I sign off please hang on the line for three minutes to have a look at the e-coach testimonials and then come back tomorrow at 8.50 be early 8.50 central Canberra AIS time and we will see you all tomorrow have a good day Participating in the course so far, um, it's been a great opportunity to work with other coaches online with some great online communication. We were able to design some of the topics that we wanted to cover in the course. The course contains a thing of um, 40 participants. Um, we meet uh, weekly. Um, we separate into two groups. One meets on Monday, one Thursday. We go and do different little tasks and we come back and we discuss it as a, as a big group. And, um, and then we also go away and do, you know, personal development and write down what, how it relates to us as a coach in our environment. The key takeouts are really about understanding myself better as a, as a person and as a coach and using that knowledge to help understand the athletes better. It's been great to really understand all the, all the styles and, and tricks and put it together in my own philosophy and I feel confident in delivering that even more now. The answers that, that we're looking for in sports of athletics are very similar to the answers that other sports uh, chase and sharing that with, with different coaches it's, it's very powerful and um, I really enjoy that part. Being part of the course helped me to reflect on myself and my coaching and my coaching philosophy. It's made me stop and think and, and um, when I'm coaching morning and night and, and how I relate to each different individual. We don't only get the content but we get the uh, get the support in the background to, to be able to use that content in a practical way. I think more competent coaches can serve the athletes better and even the smallest things learned from the course can have a very positive impact on them. If we understand ourselves well, it really, and if we're able to use those skills to help the athletes understand themselves better, and we can be better coaches for the athletes. The athletes are always looking for that 1% in their, in their performance, and courses like this can help us deliver that 1%. It's allowed me to sort of start to diversify my thinking and help my athletes become stronger athletes. In developing ourselves and in, in, in more people skills and um, in more that mental aspects and leaderships and you know techniques of uh, building uh, confidence in athletes and um, building resilience in them. Programs like the E-Coach program uh, develops and builds a great community in our sport. No matter what sport we are, we, we're we building a, a stronger connection to all sport. It's made COVID less of an impact for sure because I think coming out the other side, I'm a much better coach for the experience.